I have the honor to be your presenter today. My name is Fadl Solomon. I am the National Chaplain of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, WAMI, and the Muslim Chaplain at the American University in DC. I am 37 years old. I am married from one woman, and I have two kids. Is this screen big enough, or would you like us to bring a bigger one? <laughs> Actually, some people may say, is it important to hear or to know about Muslims? If we went outside and we stopped anyone and we asked him, what do you know about the Chinese? How do they look? And he said, well, they have blonde hair. This will not sound good. Or they have curly hair. This still will not sound good. Or what is China? And he said, well, China is in Europe. Everybody knows that. It will sound very ignorant. Why? Because the Chinese are a very big group of people. 20% of the population of this world are Chinese. How come anyone doesn't know some factors about the Chinese, like political factors, geographical factors, historical factors? Same thing. Muslims are 20% of the population of this world. That's why we will speak about Islam tonight, and this will be in brief. I assure you, this will be in brief. When we speak about Islam, we are speaking about one of the three monotheistic religions, the three great religions of the world, the Abrahamic religions, as some people call it, uh, the Hebrew religion, Judaism, the Christian religion, and Islam as a religion and as a way of life. So Islam is not just a religion. If we define what is a religion, we can say a religion is a system to show us who to worship and how to worship. Islam is much more than this. Islam is a whole way of life. It is supposed to be the way of life of 1.3 billion people in this world. 250 million of them are Arabs, and more than 1 billion are non-Arabs. They are Chinese Muslims, Indian Muslims, European Muslims, American Muslims, Latinos Muslims. And this is the title of our presentation tonight. M plus six, plus five equals Islam. M for the meaning of the word Islam. Six for the six beliefs that are obligatory for every Muslim to believe in, in order to be a Muslim. And five for the five deeds that are obligatory for every Muslim to do in order to be a Muslim. First, with the meaning of the word Islam. Linguistically, Islam comes from the root, the word Salama, which means purity. And the part of the word Salam means peace. But the word Islam, it means surrender or submission. So Islam linguistically carries the three meanings of surrender, purity, and peace. Islamically, it means if any person fully surrenders himself or herself to Almighty God alone, worshiping Him purely, he will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the life after. So even Islamically, it carries the three meanings. If you surrender yourself to God, worshiping Him purely, you will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the life after. So the word Muslim, means it's an Arabic word that means someone who surrenders to God, someone who submits to Almighty God. We're not called after someone called Selim, so we're Muslims. No, Muslim is an adjective that describes a situation, someone who is submitting. Before we go through our six beliefs and the five deeds, there are some relevant issues that I need to talk with you about. I am not expecting you to agree on them all, but it's a matter of perspective. 
First, Muslims believe that every human being is born preformatted to submit to God, which means that every one of us was born clean and good and pure by nature. We don't believe that uh, uh, because I am born Arab, then I'm stupid. Or because I'm a Hispanic, then I'm lazy. Or because I'm white, then I'm cruel. Or because I am black, then I'm something else. This, we don't believe in this. We believe that no one can come on the day of judgment in front, in, in, and stand uh, uh, in front of God and tell him, I was born bad. No, we were born clean, pure by nature. Muslims believe that every human being have free will. Human beings have free will. God Almighty showed us the right path and the wrong path, and then he left us to choose freely. No compulsion in religion. Actually, this is a verse in the Quran. In chapter number two, it says, let there be no compulsion in religion. Which means that no one can enforce anyone to accept Islam. As a religion, Islam is an action of the heart. Uh, no one can put the gun in the head of someone and tell him, sign this paper. I am a Muslim, write your full name. If he did so, he's not a Muslim yet. It's an action of the heart. And Muslims believe that people are born without any inherited sin. Although we are from Adam and Adam is from earth, but we believe that if someone committed a sin or made a mistake, he will come on the day of judgment carrying his own sin on his own shoulders, not on the shoulders of his sons or his grandsons or his grand, 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 grandsons. We believe that there is no supremacy. All people are equal. One of the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, all people in the sight of God are as equal as the teeth of a comb. He said also there is no privilege for an Arab on an un-Arab, or for a white on a black, except according to their piety, righteousness. So it's piety and righteousness, not racism, which means that we do not believe that God Almighty chose any people because of their race and made them their chosen people. So he did not choose the Arabs, nor the Jews, nor the Hispanics. And now with these six beliefs. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in those six beliefs. I have to believe in Almighty God, Allah. Is he a different God? We will come to this in details. I have to believe in the angels. I have to believe in the scriptures, the books. And I have to believe in the messengers. I have to believe in the day of resurrection. And finally, I have to believe in the divine destiny. Let's go through every one of these. Muslims believe in Allah. What does it mean? Muslims believe that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And this shouldn't be offensive for anybody because Allah is an Arabic word that means the one God. I am originally from Egypt. And in my country, there are 7 million Christian Egyptians and all of them are worshiping Allah. In the Arabic Christian Bible, it is mentioned just in the first page 17 times, Allah. In Genesis, Jews, Arab Jews, they worship Allah. So Allah is a word that means the one God. It is the proper noun for Allah for God and also Allah has so many attributes and names that describe him but why do Muslims use frequently the word Allah he is the merciful he is the forgiving but we always say I'm going to pray to Allah Allah is great why because I may have a merciful uh, son and a forgiving daughter but Allah is the proper noun for God. Some of the names, okay. we believe that Allah is unique. Allah has no partners. Allah alone is the creator of this universe. 
And he's alone the sustainer of all that exists. Allah does not father, nor he was born. Because he is unique. And there is nothing like unto him. And of course, he's neither male nor female. Some of the names of Allah. Allah is the merciful. Allah is the all-beneficent. He is the savior, the knower of all, the bestower of honors, and the humiliator, the hearer of all, the seer of all, the judge, the just, the all-aware, the magnificent, the forgiver, the highest, the greatest, the preserver, the mighty, the generous, the watchful one, the responder to prayer, the perfectly wise, the loving one, the majestic one, the resurrector, the truth, the possessor of all strength, the giver of life and the taker of life, the ever living one and the self existing one, the all powerful, the supreme one, the avenger, the patient one and the guide to repentance and so many other names and attributes. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the angels. We believe that there are angels. They are created from light. They do not have free will. It's not a matter of oppressing angels, but angels will not be held accountable. Every angel is assigned to do a specific task. Some of them to protect human beings. Others to carry the messages to the messengers of God. Others to record our deeds. So we believe that there's an angel recording our good deeds and an angel recording our bad deeds, not a devil. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the books. I have to believe in all books of Allah, all the scriptures that he sent. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the Torah, which was sent to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. I have to believe in the gospel or the Injil, which was sent to Prophet Jesus, son of Mary, the Christ, the Messiah. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the Quran, which was given to Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And I have to believe in the Psalms of David and the scriptures that were given to Abraham. Muslims believe that Archangel Gabriel carried them 100% correct to the messengers of God. And we believe that the Quran is the only book that has been kept safe in its original language, the Arabic language. So if someone told you, let me give you an English Quran, there's nothing so called English Quran. It's an English translation to the Quran. But the original text, the Arabic, is the text that was revealed. Like the Gospel or the Injil that was revealed to Prophet Jesus Christ, it was an Aramaic. Anything else is there is a human contribution by translating, by interpreting, then this is not the divine text. But the Quran is the book that has been kept safe in the original language Arabic. What is the Quran? Quran is the last revelation. I know that Christians like to use the terminology testament. Old Testament and the New Testament. Well then Quran, we can say it is the last testament. Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. It deals with all subjects concerning human beings, including wisdom, doctrine, worship, and law. The basic themes of the Quran are the relationship between God and his creatures and between people one and another. The Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. This is a sample from the Quran that Muslims are, ob are, are obliged to read it 17 times every day during their five prayers. It says, In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, all praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the compassionate, the merciful, King of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, and to you alone we turn for help. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have incurred your anger, not of those who have gone astray. Amen. And that's another sample from the Quran. But actually, I always, I always like to hide this sample first because I like to speak about it for a minute. This sample is very special to me because it is an answer to a question that I used to have in my mind for so many years. I used to ask myself, why did God create us all different? Men and women, and always problems between men and women. 
white and black. And there was always problems between white and black. And now Arabs and the Chinese, Japanese, Latinos. Wasn't it a better idea that he could have created us all from one background? All of us speaking the same language, looking the same, all of us white speaking English, or all of us Chinese speaking Chinese, and of course eating Chinese. But because in this book, the Quran, you can find an answer to any question that you have in mind, I found the answer. God Almighty says, O oh mankind, we created you from male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. Then it is the blessing of God that he created us different. Imagine that we were all equal. All of us were white, speaking French, looking the same. Or all of us Latinos speaking Spanish, period. Can you imagine life like that? So boring life. Of course, there won't be anything called tourism. Travel where, go what, see what. Everything is the same, a boring life. But like that, God gave us a chance to discover each other, get to know each other. But instead of get, making use of this blessing, people are abusing this blessing of Allah by attacking each other, invading the lands of each other, occupying the homes of each other. And the rest of the verse, Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah are the Arabs. Oh no, not the Arabs. The Jews, the Hispanics, no. Oh, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Yo, so we are all equal. One humankind. One God and one humankind. And Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the messengers. We believe that it was always one message for all messengers. If he is one God and we are one humankind and you agree with me on that, then why send different messages? Of course, it was always one message sent through ages through, with different messengers, but it was always the same message and that was the message. Worship God alone and do not associate any partners with him. We believe that all messengers are the best human beings and they do not commit sins. They do not commit major sins. So we do not believe that a messenger of God can commit or committed adultery. Actually, because when God, the creator, chose, he chose the best of, the, of his creatures and made them his messengers. And if someone can commit adultery, with the wife of his son at the corner of the street. Can't he tell lies? He can tell lies. So how come I believe in the scriptures that he carried to me? Muslims believe that messengers of Allah are the most honored and the most respectable people and they do not commit major sins. Muslims believe that none of them is divine. None of them is the son of God. And we believe that Jesus is a messenger like other messengers. But actually, Jesus, for us, has special respect, and his mother, of course. And we consider him one of the best five people ever walked on earth, starting by Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Those five messengers suffered a lot, and they carried a very important message. And to prove to you that this is my religion, I'm not trying to beautify my religion, this is what Allah is telling us in the Quran, the principal source of every Muslim's faith and practice. God is telling us, say, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us, which is the Quran, and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them, and we submit to Allah, which means, and we are Muslims. To be a Muslim, I have to believe in the day of judgment. We believe that there will be resurrection after death. We believe that we will be reading our books of deeds, 
and we will be held accountable at that day. And then it will be a fair trial judgment then after either to paradise or to hell. And this will be an eternal life. And finally, the last belief, Muslims believe in the divine destiny. Actually, this is why Muslims do not have depression. Muslims may be angry, sad, but not depressed because we have this belief, the divine destiny. We believe that nothing happens without the knowledge of Allah. We believe that by his knowledge, he prescribed everything. So whatever happens to me, good or bad, why worry? He knows. How many times some of you were very depressed and sad because some things happened and after a few years they discovered that that was the best thing ever happened to them. How many times some of you were very glad when some things happened to them in their lives after a few years they discovered that was the worst thing ever happened to me in my life. No, we believe in the divine destiny. And to conclude this, we believe that God knows what happened, what is happening now, what will happen in the future. And he even knows the fourth, which is, he knows what will not happen. If it happened, how it would happen. But some people may think that this contradicts with what we said in the first slide, that people have free will. How can people have free will? And he knows what will happen. If he knows what will happen, then he should put us under some circumstances that what we do in the future meets his knowledge. And actually, my answer to this is very simple because one day I was asked this question in a Methodist church and I had my son with me. He is five years old. And when we entered, I told him, Anas, either you sit here and watch the presentation with them or you take this coloring book and color in the back. And I knew 99.9% what he will choose without influencing him. So if, and this is because I am his father, I have more knowledge about that age, I have more experience than him, so I can know what he will choose. So how about the creator who created us and he knows our nature? Can't he know 100% what you will choose without influencing you. And like that we finish the six beliefs and now with the five deeds to be a Muslim, I have to declare my faith. I have to say this inseparable testimony. There is no deity but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Establishing the prayer, I have to pay a financial obligation. How much? To who? We will come to this in details. To be a Muslim, I have to fast the month of Ramadan. And finally, I have to make pilgrimage. First, with the testimony. This testimony is the key to enter Islam. So I, I believe you heard that uh, Islam is the fastest growing religion. In America, at least. Actually, before 9-11, it was the fastest growing religion. After 9-11, it became the super growing religion. People heard more. They attended lectures, presentations. They bought books, pamphlets, and they read it. And when they come to us and tell us, well, guys, I need to join you. I need those meanings to be in my life. What do I do? We tell him, just say, there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, and Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. We believe that this is the key to enter Islam. So whoever says this with sincerity is to be considered a Muslim. And whoever dies on this belief will enter paradise if his sins were forgiven. Because we don't believe that because we are Muslims, we don't have any sins. Our sins are forgiven or we have a blank check to go to paradise. To be a Muslim, I have to perform the prayers. Muslims pray five daily obligatory prayers. They have to be done on time. The first one is at dawn which is like 5.15 in the morning now. The second one is at noon. The third is in the afternoon. The fourth after sunset. And the fifth is in the evening. So if you live beside a mosque and you found that the Muslims come every day 
and they park their cars at five o'clock in the morning for 15 minutes only and then they take it, don't worry, they're just praying. <laughs> Someone told me before this presentation, I always thought that Muslims are drug dealers. <laughs> what are they doing at five o'clock in the morning every day, come to me, do what? No, those prayers should be done on time. They should be done on any pure spot on earth. I can pray here in the university, there in the mosque, at home. The best way to do it is to do it congregational in the mosque. If I'm too lazy to go to the mosque every prayer or the mosque is far from me, I can do it congregation with my family at home. If there's no one to pray with me, I can do it individually, anywhere. And we all turn our faces towards one direction, all towards Mecca, uh, which gives the sense of unity that all Muslims are standing, praying in circles all over the earth. And it is in the Christian Bible. I believe many of you saw Muslims praying in a very weird way. They're prostrating themselves on the floor, on the ground. Actually, it is in the Christian Bible that all prophets fell on their faces in prayer. You will find in Matthew, Jesus Christ falling on his face in prayer. You will find Abraham, Moses, and Aaron falling on their faces in prayer. So the question is not, why do Muslims pray like that? Well, we can rephrase the question and say, why non-Muslims do not pray like that? I really invite you to pray like that. Put your head, put your nose and your forehead on the floor for your creator and see how close to God you will be. But do not put them on the floor for anyone else. Just for your creator. Do not humiliate yourself to anyone else. And financial obligation. To be a Muslim, I pay a financial obligation called the zakah. Muslims do pay 2.5% of any cash savings held for one year to the poor, to the needy, to the hungry people, and to the homeless. We pay 5 to 10% of any agricultural income. Back home in Egypt, I used to have an oranges ranch. And I used to pay 5% of my agricultural income, not 10%. Why? because I have an irrigation system, which means that I have costs coming out of my pocket. So I pay 5%. In some countries, they have a lot of rain, so they depend on rain. In this case, they pay 10% of their agriculture income because they don't have much costs coming out of their pockets. Muslims should pay 20% of any extracted resources or minerals to the poor, to the needy, to the hungry people, and to the homeless, like petroleum. And actually, this applies on governments also. Before they go buy arms for their armies and weapons, they should spend at least 20% of their resources on the poor, on the needy, and on the homeless. And we believe, as Muslims, that when this system is applied in any country, there will not be one homeless or one hungry person in this country. And it was applied during history, during some phases of time. One of, one of uh, that times, it was applied during the time of someone called Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was ruling the Muslim nation from Morocco to the border of China. And at the first year, the people whom he sent carrying this money, the zakah, to the poor people. Second year, they came back with most of the money. He said, why, why didn't you spend the, 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 all the money on the poor? They said, because we couldn't find much poor like before. There isn't poor people like before. He said, what? Why? How come? They said, well, because you are just. He said, then start marrying the singles with this money. That's a system that the creator who created us put, that it is the perfect system. Well, if your Toyota went out of order, what is the best company to fix it? Toyota. Why? Because they made it. So they know every little tiny part in it. They know when they hear this, so this uh, sound, then this part should be changed. They know it. Same thing, the creator who created us, he knows the perfect system for us. And guess what? This is not a charity. It is the right of the poor on the rich. So the one who is not paying this uh, among Muslims is like a thief. 
And guess what? He is stealing the poor people. Muslims do pay charity, which is more than that. One of the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, spend in charity with your right hand what your left hand doesn't know, which is a sign of do not show off. Don't spend $100 in charity and go make an, uh, uh, an advertising for $1,000 in the Washington Post, say, I spend $100. No, have sincerity in your heart. And because it's the right of the poor and the rich, so the one who is paying this is purifying his money. And because we are purifying our money, it grows. And actually the word zakah, it means growth. Can you imagine this? God is telling us, spend these amounts, and he is calling this ritual growth. And alhamdulillah, those who spend this money, really their money grow. But those who do not spend this money in charity, problems happen to them and they lose their money in business and we all saw these experiences. To be a Muslim, I have to fast the month of Ramadan. In, 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 uh, in that month, which is the uh, ninth lunar uh, month in the lunar calendar, we do not eat, drink, or have any sexual activity, of course, with our spouses, from dawn till sunset. It is a ritual of worship that enhances patience and perseverance through discipline. If you can control yourself at dawn from doing the lawful, control yourself from food and drinking, and then by sunset you can practice this again. And then control yourself again next day, and then practice. Control, practice. You see what I'm doing? It's like working out. You're disciplining yourself. After 30 days of success, then you prove to yourself that you are in control. You are controlling your body. You are controlling your desires. Then you can control yourself from doing the unlawful. And the last deed is pilgrimage. It is a must. It is an obligation on those who are able only. Once in a lifetime as an obligation. And those who are able financially and health-wise. And it shows the universality of this religion. Actually, last year, I made pilgrimage with 2.5 million people. All of us wearing the same simple clothes. If you see one of us, you don't know if he's a millionaire or if he is a poor person. We're all wearing the same, eating together, praying together, doing the same rituals together. And actually, this changed the life of so many people. One of them is Malcolm X. How many of you heard about Malcolm X? Yeah. Malcolm X, before doing this ritual, before going to pilgrimage, he was from a group that had some racist views towards white people. Maybe because of all what the black people went through here in this country, but still, as a Muslim, you do not have an excuse to have any racist views towards anybody. When he went to pilgrimage and he came back, he changed. And he wrote this in his biography. Go buy it from the library. It's a beautiful biography. He wrote, I ate from the same plate. And I drank from the same cup of people whom their skin is the whitest of the white. And their eyes are the bluest of the blue. And their hair is the blondest of the blonde. And in their deeds and in their worship, I felt the same sincerity of the black people of Ghana, Sudan, and Africa. He was astonished. He never knew that, and he came back to America, and he joined mainstream Islam. Now we finished the six beliefs and the five deeds, but I have three very important uh, issues to speak to you about, especially here in America. There are concerns for so many people. The first one is hijab, which is how Muslim women are wearing you see this scarf? And the status of women in Islam. And finally, jihad. I believe it doesn't need explanation. With the first issue, hijab. Whose picture is this? Yeah, Christians believe this is the picture of Virgin Mary. And this is a Catholic nun. And this is one of my relatives. She's a Muslim girl. Now the quiz that we have for you tonight. What is common in the three of them? For God's sake, what is common? 
they are all wearing hijab. They are totally covered except face and hands. Why do Muslim women wear like that? We said that the Quran is the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. God Almighty told us in the Quran, and say to the believing men, he didn't say women here, that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty that is purer for them. And Allah is aware of all that they do. Then I also have a hijab. In a sunny day like today, you will not see me walking in the streets with a short, without a t-shirt, to have a color. I can do that, but not in public. In public, I should be wearing modestly. And the rest of the verse, and say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty except that which is apparent, interpreted face and hands, and to draw their veils over their bosoms, and not to reveal their beauty except to their husbands, their fathers, their husbands' fathers, their sons, their husbands' sons, their brothers and the brothers' sons and their sisters' sons, which means that Muslim women are not always wearing like that. In front of close relatives, they are wearing normally, showing their hair, their arms. Actually, Muslim women, if you talk to them, because some people think that the men beat their women to wear like that. Actually, my wife is sitting here. You can ask her how many times I beat her every day to wear like that. But uh, I loved so much what some Muslim women said to me that after I embraced Islam and I wore hijab, I felt that I am taking control. I am having the remote control with me. And I can show that man only my face and my hands. And that man, because he is my father, or that man, because he is my brother, I can show him my hair and my arms. And that man, because he is my husband, I can show him anything that I want. I am taking control. I am more free than before. I like that so much. Another sister told me, well, I like when people deal with me as a piece of mind, not as a piece of meat. Anyway, now with the status of women in Islam. In Islam, all men and women are equal before God. Both of them are equal before the law. Men and women are both subject to be equally rewarded or equally punished by God and by the law. In Islam, women are like men. They have the right to gain education, engage in business, engage in professions, public life, and keep their family names. If I showed you the ID, the driver license of my wife, you will find her name, Shireen Hussein Mahmoud Ibrahim. And if you took my ID, it says Fadil Kamil Solomon. And guess what? She's my wife since 11 years. Still her name didn't change, and it will not change. Because we believe that like that, she's keeping her identity. Why should she go and change her family name? If you change your family name, what do you go? You go to the DMV. To do what? Change your ID, your identity. So, no, Muslim women keep their family names and their possessions are secured. So, the Muslim man doesn't have the right to touch a penny of his wife's money. Actually, it is his obligation to cover the household expenses. And if she spent and helped, it's considered a charity from her. She has other obligations and other responsibilities, completely separate financial identity, she should pay zakah on her money. He should pay zakah, the financial obligation on his money, and so on. To conclude, if any society or individual oppresses women or discriminates against them, then it is against Islam, not because of it. And finally, jihad. The word jihad comes from the root jahada, which means someone doing great effort. So the word jihad, linguistically in Arabic, it means striving and struggling. Islamically, it has two meanings. The first one is a nonviolent struggling within oneself for a life of virtue. You struggle against your ego to be a better person, 
spend in charity a hundred dollars and try not to tell anyone, not even your closest friend. See how hard is it? It needs jihad. It needs to struggle, to have sincerity. And the second is fighting to establish justice, which is a supreme goal, not only in Islamic teachings, in any civilization. If justice cannot be established through peaceful means, then you have to fight to establish justice. Regain back your rights. Regain back your homeland. But even if Muslims went to the battlefield to fight to establish justice or to do jihad, there are some limitations stated by Prophet Muhammad in his traditions. One of them is never kill innocent people. Never injure prisoners of war. Never kill animals. Never destroy crops. Never destroy infrastructures. Never mutilate bodies of enemies, dead or alive. All prisoners should be given fair treatment. Women and children should be protected from harm. And always bury all dead with respect. So if the enemy fled the battlefield, leaving their dead behind them, it is the obligation of the Muslim army to bury their dead, like they bury their own dead, respecting their humanity. Also, prisoners should be given fair treatment. It is the obligation of the Muslim army to feed the prisoners and to give them shelter. And if there is no enough food, Guess what? The prisoners will eat and the Muslim army will not. The Muslim they are free people. They should go find a way, find something to eat. But those people are captured. You can't leave them starve. And that was 1400 years before the Geneva Convention. Of course, we hear that day today about the Geneva Convention of the POWs. If you go to this Geneva Convention, you will not find anything more than this. Maybe except showing them on TV. And Islam advocates moderation and abhors extremism, terrorism, fanaticism, and oppression. Thank you very much. Like that, we finished our uh, presentation, but there is a very important part, which is the evaluation forms. So during our uh, taking the questions and answers, if you can please fill the English evaluation forms that you have, and I welcome any questions now. Can we turn on the lights? Yes. Yeah, there's a microphone here. Oh, thank you. There's a microphone here on, the, on that side if anyone wants to ask any questions. By the way, before asking any questions, Muslims believe that there is no weak points in their religion, which means that no one question is offensive for us. So go on, start asking offensive questions. Don't worry. Um, I have a question. I have a friend, uh, Shabi Khan, and I've known him for nine months, and he tells me that in Islam, uh, hell is not eternal, that Allah just beat you up for a while until you, you repent or are forgiven. Well, the majority of the Muslim scholars believe that hell and paradise are eternal. But maybe not everybody will stay in hell forever. And not everybody will stay. But everybody who goes to paradise, he can stay there forever. He had given me the impression it was a temporary situation. That you just had to go through some beatings with Allah. Yes, that's true, that's true. Uh, those who have the right creed, they may be punished for some of their sins or forgiven completely. We don't know. Because if we know from now, then that's not a true test. But this is a true test. So you don't know what will happen later on. But one of the names of Allah is the forgiving and the merciful. But he also is the punisher. He can punish. So you're he's all just. He is all just, of course. Thank you. But he will not only treat us with justice, he will treat us with mercy. If he treated us with justice, we will fail, all of us. Because uh, it is narrated that a person on the day of judgment came to Allah and he was a worshiper who used to worship always. And then, and then 
he uh, asked Allah. Allah told the angels, take him to paradise with my mercy. He said, no, Allah, treat me with your justice. I did a lot of good things in my life. I used to worship you. Then Allah said, okay, put only the blessing of his sight in one hand and put all his deeds in the other uh, uh, part of the scale, the other side of the scale, and then all his deeds went away. Just the sight is a blessing that nothing can pay for it. So we hope that he will treat us with mercy, and he is the merciful. So you're saying he's compassionate. He is the compassionate, of course. Uh, Shabi also told me about the jinn. Can you yeah. explain that? Yeah. Uh, Muslims believe that uh, God Almighty is the Lord of the worlds. Not the world. The world of human beings. The world of angels. The world of insects, animals. The world of jinn, which are the spirits. And the world of the angels, of course. So, so many worlds in this life. Uh, Allah told us in the Quran that you have not been granted from knowledge except what is so little. So we don't really know a lot in this universe. One of these things is the unseen. Things are like angels, jinn, devils. Those are kind of things that we are unseen, but we believe in it because we were told so in, in our book, and we have the proof that that book is authentic, then we have to take it all. Yes. Yes. What are the duties of women in Islam? You mentioned the men's duties in particular, but you didn't mention the women's duties. Okay, the, du the duties of women in Islam. Women in Islam are like men, and there is a, a tradition of Prophet Muhammad. We have two main sources in Islam. The Quran, which is the word of God, and the Sunnah, which is the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, which are also a revelation from God, but in the words of the Prophet himself. And he said one of those traditions, he said, women are like twins with men. They have the same duties. Women and men are equal, but they are not similar. You see, men are different and women than women, but they are equal. In duties, they are equal. In uh, uh, other things they are not, because they may be not similar. But one of the duties of women is to take care of the family, the household. She can work, she can engage in business, in, in public life, in a lot of things. Uh, actually, one of the things that uh, confuse people is what they see sometimes on TV, or what they know about what's happening in some different uh, parts of the world and we all know that Islam spread all over the world there are 55 countries in this world that the majority of the people are Muslims and those are called the Muslim countries but some many of these countries are applying their own traditions mixed with Islam what I showed you now is Islam pure but you may go to Egypt or to Saudi Arabia or to Pakistan or to Brazil the people who are living in the desert are different from the people who are living in the jungle, are different from the people who are living in the, in the mountains. Different nature with different cultures and different traditions. And sometimes they mix their traditions and cultures with Islam. What is accepted by Islam is accepted. And some of the culture and traditions are not accepted. Yes. Um, I just want to know your opinion on this. Do you think that um, because Islam does not have a highly stratified hierarchy as with the Coptics or the Greek Orthodox or the Catholics, a centralized, very strict hierarchy, do you think that that has contributed to a lot of extremism that is, exists vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban within the religion? Well, the reason of extremism is that some people do not understand the youth. And by the way, the Muslim youth can be a disaster, like other youth, if you do not know how to deal with them. Any youth in the world, you should know how to deal with them, how to listen to them, and how to talk to them. So I believe this can be one of the reasons of extremism, especially when some people kick you out of your home and they tell you, well, you need to be more polite. 
Don't throw stones at me. This sometimes drives people crazy. Do you think that the girls who are 20 years old and they bond themselves, they never had the dreams of the 20 years old girls? They had it. One, one day they used to dream about marriage, about love, about having children, but they are desperate. I am not trying to, uh, to uh, give an excuse, but I am, I am telling you, you should always try to feel the suffering of the other. And this is a, 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 a verse in the Quran. Allah said, if you suffer, then they also suffer like you suffer. That's an invitation for us to feel the pain of each other. Um, well, my question was pretty much geared, um, you know, the extremism that you're talking about is being oppressed, you know, being occupied unfairly. Um, and, of, of course, that can induce a lot of extremism because people are definitely desperate. The question that I was alluding to was really um, the, the fact that uh, governing maybe a teaching body of Islam, you know, without a single head, do you think that that has probably contributed to extreme forms of Islam like the, what, what the Taliban was practicing, which what they practice, of course, I, was I, not... I actually don't know much about what the Taliban were practicing, but... Uh, the, what I saw during the, the time that they were ruling, I didn't like at all. Right, right. I didn't like it at all. But we are also told in our religion not to judge till we hear both parties. But what I saw, the part that I saw was awful. Right? But it is in the Quran that Prophet David, a person came to him and he told him, I have one goat and my brother has 99 goats and he wants to take mine. So he said, oh, your brother oppressed you. He transgressed against you. And then Solomon, his son, told him, wait, dad, we have to hear the other party. And then the other party proved by witnesses that he has 100 goats and his brother doesn't have any goats. So you should always hear both parties before you come to a judgment. Okay, and the other question I have, could you elaborate on um, uh, parts in the Quran which, talks about, which talk about Jesus' return? Yes, uh, Muslims believe that Jesus Christ was not crucified and that he was uh, elevated. He was, God took him. And by the way, we believe that in the last days, Jesus will return back and he will pray like Muslims used to pray and prove to people that he is one of the messengers of Islam as I showed you. spoken uh, about a lot of wonderful things about your religion this evening and I'd like to know how you how if you find it difficult to separate uh, what a lot of the American culture believes about your religion from what you've been showing us tonight and how you go about doing it other than just in this fashion thank you that's a very good question the, the problem is a lot of what the Americans know about our religion came from the media and this is completely distorted we all know, we all know that uh, the people who are controlling the media are not very friends with the Muslims. So they do not show by any means any good side. They only show negative parts and a lot of times, a lot of uh, things that are completely wrong. For instance, let me give you uh, an example. You remember six months ago, the Church of Nativity in Palestine when it was under siege? And I used to watch on Fox News and NBC uh, that the uh, Israelis, the good guys, are surrounding the church trying to free the priests who were taken hostages on Al Jazeera and Dubai and Egyptian channels. We used to see the priests speaking on the phone and we know them. They are big figures. And they are saying the Israelis are shooting at us. They killed two priests up till now. One of them was ringing the bell and they shot the statue of Virgin Mary. So the problem is I never expected that the media in America can be that biased. I knew always that it's biased, but not to that extent. That's a problem that a lot of what the American know about Islam and Muslims come from the media. But a lot of Americans now started not to trust media that much and started to go and ask. We used to have presentations every day in a lot of places. We used to have now uh, people coming to us to the mosques and ask us, 
our bookshelves were blown. No books after 9-11. One month after 9-11, there wasn't any Quran translated in English in the United States. And we had to print again and again. Just my, my uh, uh, organization, we printed more than 2 million pamphlets since 9-11. Well, how do you find your, how do you uh, separate yourselves from, from, from what you've been speaking to us about tonight and from extremist actions that we've seen in the past is, is basically my question. And also, yeah, why yeah. do you think that there is such a bias in the media yeah. regarding it? I, I believe you, you, uh, you mean 9-11. Yes. Yes, good. By the way, on 9-11, I was in Manhattan. Uh, I was attending the convention of the United Nations uh, a convention for non or, uh, non -pro, uh, non-profit organizations and I had some friends coming from overseas and they said let's uh, make some uh, sightseeing in uh, in New York and they went and they visited the Empire State and they were supposed to visit the World Trade Center and then they said well let's postpone this till father comes to us from Washington DC till tomorrow and tomorrow was 9-11, and our convention starts at 9.30, so we were supposed to go and visit at 8.30 or 8.40. So I could have not been here now if I went, but we couldn't find a taxi, and we had to go directly to the United Nations. So 9-11, I do not know one Muslim scholar who justified this. Even those who are the scholars of the organizations that are banned lately in the United States, they said it is wrong. It cannot be justified. Because I show, as I showed you, in Islam, you can go and fight to establish justice. But the first thing in the traditions of Prophet Muhammad is do not kill innocent people. And the people who went to, uh, to the uh, World Trade Center that day, many of them never even heard about Palestine or Muslims at all. 600 of the 3,000 were Muslims already. So nothing that happened on 9-11 can be justified by Islam. But we believe that anyone who kills innocent people is a terrorist, whether he lives in caves or anywhere else. And with that, do you support the current uh, war on terrorism or what is considered a war on terrorism? I actually hate to, uh, to, to turn this uh, a presentation into a political presentation, but of course I support war and terrorism if it's not done like that. Jihad is war on terrorism. But you should always deal with the root cause. If some people, what happened in 9-11 is insane. Actually, this is the edge of insanity. Some people uh, hijacking planes, going through buildings, this is crazy. But we should always Think, what made people go to the edge of insanity like that? Instead of just stripping people in the airports. This is not dealing with the root cause. Like that, we will always be uh, on alert. I believe that this should be left to politicians, but we should always tell them, please, keep aside your uh, interests, keep aside anything that you hear, hear both sides, and try to deal with things with more sincerity and in a better way. I do not agree with what is happening, but I agree with war and terrorism because it is in Islam to have war on terrorism. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. I actually have two questions. The first uh, is there's a 700 plus year span between the uh, Old Testament and the Quran. Right. Um, in the span, what is to keep someone from believing that Allah changed his mind between the two prints. Would he tell someone something in 700 years, change his mind, tell Muhammad something else? Okay. By the way, Allah did not tell Muhammad something else because both of them carried the same message. Okay? But one of the verses in the Quran is about the prophet of Islam, Jesus Christ. He came and told the Israelis, the sons of Israel, I came to you to ease what was revelated to you, what was revealed to you uh, through Moses. Because Allah made it a little bit difficult on them, and then Jesus was sent to make it more easy to them. So what changes are very, but nothing in the concept changes. Nothing in the concept change, but some rituals may change. The way of fasting may change, things like that. But they always carried the one 
message. Worship God alone and do not associate any parties with him. They all had the same concepts of prayer, of fasting, of pilgrimage even. Okay? But Allah doesn't change his mind. It is through ages, things change and needs to be. It's like when Microsoft issued Windows 95. And then they issued Windows 98. And 2000, Millennium, XP, the latest is XP, right? It's abrogating all the rest. But still, the rest were from Microsoft to the computer users, right? But they do not now work as the XP. It's just a newer version, but the concept is the same. And second question is, uh, Islam allows four wives for a man, allows it, but obviously does not yes. recommend or appreciate it. Yes. Um, what about women? What keeps, what Good. is the law versus Good. Uh, women and marriage? Good. Thank you. Actually, yes, uh, Islam came to decrease the number of wives because at that time it was for like about 10 wives for every man. And if you go to the Christian Bible, you can even find that uh, King uh, David married hundreds of wives and Solomon and also Gideon had like a thousand wives. But uh, Islam came to decrease this because there is always a need for this. Uh, men may die in wars. Uh, when a woman uh, is divorced and have children, she shouldn't just beg. Someone can come and marry her and take care of her and her children. I want to ask you a question. You know, of course, that the United States law doesn't allow this. And of course, Muslims, American Muslims, they have to respect, this is by Islam, they have to respect the law of the country that they are living in and they accept it to live in. So they do, do not practice this in, the, in, in America. But this law in America allows a man to have one wife and 10 mistresses, or as we call it now, a, pol a polite way, 10 girlfriends and have sex with them. It's not a crime. But if he, if he had two wives, both in the light, both of them have rights and have duties in front of everybody, oh, that's a crime. This is what I think it doesn't make sense for me. Okay. I got a couple questions too. Um, first question was, could you explain the, uh, I think it's called jizya, the, uh, the non-Muslim tax? Um, yeah, the zakat. Yeah. And go, so. That's the first question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I explained it. Do you need more explanation about this? Yeah. Uh, jizya. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I thought there's a cap. Yeah, the non-Muslim tax. Yes. Uh, in the Islamic nation, Muslims should pay the zakah, which is 2.5% of cash savings, 5 to 10% on the agriculture income, 20% if they have any resources extracted. The non-Muslims pay a tax. It's called the protection tax because... They, they are protected, so they pay something that is less than 2.5%. And I pay 35% here in this country, and I don't feel any oppression. So yes, everybody should pay tax in the country that he's living in. And my second question is, how does Islam look on uh, uh, suicide bombing, specifically in regards to someone killing themselves? Yeah. And also in regard to, um, I know it says killing innocents, um, so, and women and children, so that, that happens sometimes. And suicide is a major sin in Islam. And Muslims believe that if someone committed suicide, he will never go and see paradise, ever. He will go directly to hell on a, on a motorcycle or something, but directly to hell. Yeah, but the one who dies in a battle is not considered to be someone who committed suicide. I mean, considered battle, or no? no? No. Suicide is suicide. Okay. Right? But the one who dies in a battle, if they are killing him, killing his family, shooting at him with Apaches, tanks, anything, and he dies, this is not. This is a battle. If he tried to uh, to uh, confront them and to uh, uh, keep away this kind of oppression, and he died, this is a battle.
Assalamualaikum. I just want to clear one thing that you said. Um, isn't it true that if someone commits suicide that they, they have the threat of going to hellfire but Allah may forgive them? Because the only sin that's not going to be forgiven is shirk. Isn't yes, that Allah forgives everything. Allah said in the Quran that every sin can be forgiven by Allah. Or Allah forgives all things except associating partners with him. And by the way, this is even for those who never heard about the monotheistic message. But those who heard, uh, who, who never heard about this, even those will be tested in the hereafter. Those who never heard about Islam or about the monotheistic message of Allah, they will be tested in the hereafter. They will not go because Allah will not oppress anyone. And Allah said, I will never punish anyone that I did not send a messenger to him. Yes. My question is, uh, I was taught that um, when Muslim Islam was uh, first started, they, uh, if you left Islam, you were put to death. Is that true? Can you repeat this question again? I need your voice. If you were a member of Islam yeah. and then you decided you, weren't, you did, no longer wanted to follow the religion or the way of life, were you put to death in the early Islamic period? In the early Islamic period, that's nice that you told me so. Actually, in the early Islamic period, everyone except Muslims was against Islam. The Romans, the Persians. So in any country, if someone betrayed his community, is to be killed. At that time, anyone else except Muslims was against Islam. Islam was under siege from so many nations. So that was made as a decision, but it was not applied on some people who decided to quit Islam for no reason. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, it happened in one incident uh, that, I that, I, that I, I read that someone went to him and I told him, I want to go back in my covenant that I gave to you uh, earlier. The prophet didn't talk to him. He left him. Maybe someone advised him or he, he changes his mind. Next day he came to him. He said, I want to go back in my covenant. I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. The prophet didn't talk to him. And then the third time he came to him, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. The prophet left him. The guy left. The prophet never sent anyone behind him to kill him or anything. I, I showed you no compulsion in religion. There is no compulsion in religion. Yes. Uh, I am Egyptian and Muslim, and uh, these questions are, were supposed to be asked by uh, a friend, a Christian friend, but he was unable to attend. So if you would allow me to ask the questions. One of them, he was saying that, uh, do you think that Islam was spread by force? Islam was spread by force? Islam cannot be spread by force. Islam depends on this verse. There is no compulsion in religion. And if you went to the biggest two countries, Islamic countries in the world, Indonesia and Malaysia, one of them I think is 30, 350 million Muslims there, and the other one is more than 280 million Muslims, and not one Muslim soldier went and put his leg in those countries. So it was never spread by force. But it happened that jihad can be allowed to remove the oppression and remove the tyrants. But what happened is that the Romans and the Persians, they committed acts of war first. So the war was launched against them. And Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia now, was a Christian country. The guy there who was ruling this country, those people were not oppressors, so Muslims are not allowed to fight them. And never happened that Muslims fought people in Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia now. Uh, also, the second part that uh, if you have the chance to read the Bible, yes. did you find anything that says that the Prophet uh, Jesus Christ uh, mentioned that there will be no prophet after him? Because uh, my friend said that... I read that the Bible in English and in Arabic, all if, of it, Old and New Testament. Yeah. I, I didn't read that uh, Jesus Christ mentioned that there would be no prophet uh, after him. Okay. Uh, second, and he even didn't say, I am God. Okay. Yes. Second, uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, he was highly regarded uh, Jesus Christ, and he mentioned something of good words about him. Would you elaborate about this? Because yes, they actually, think uh, one of the uh, chapters, important chapters, big chapters in the Quran is called Mary. Okay? And it speaks about this uh, 
about this story. The story of Jesus and Mary in the Quran is a very beautiful story. It is a different version from what the Christians believe, but still it is a very beautiful story. Jesus and Mary have very special esteem, very special respect in Islam. I cannot be a Muslim if I don't love Jesus. And if I don't think, and if I don't believe that Jesus is a messenger of God, one of the best five messengers. And uh, we believe that he was born miraculously without a father, like Adam was born miraculously without a father or a mother. And that he is the Messiah, and he will return on, uh, in, in the last days. There is a lot to say about this actually, but it's not time for this now. It needs a special presentation. Jesus Christ needs from us a special presentation. Thank you. Thank you. There is um, something. How could you clear up for someone who has grown up in a Christian family and been taught that they should never touch or read the Quran because it was revealed by the devil and will have a negative effect on them and led and lead them to hell forever. I don't know how to clear this up. <laughs> I, think, I think the one who, who sent me this is a Muslim. Because he says, how could you clear up from some, for someone who, are, who has grown up in a Christian family, never been taught him that so, so, and so, and so. I believe this is the best propaganda for Islam. Tell someone, don't do this and this and this, and don't do this and that and that and that. The first thing he will do, he will think about doing this. And I believe that, I, I would like to meet this, this person. I, I can't clear up this, actually. If, if it's revealed by the devil, then it should say very bad things and very bad words. But actually, if you go to Quran and you read it from cover to cover, you will see the light that will be thrown in your heart. It is a very beautiful book. Allah said, I have revealed the most beautiful of messages in a form of a book. Prophet Muhammad had so many miracles also. Like when Jesus used to have miracles, Moses had miracles, but the best and the, 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 the ever-living miracle of Muhammad, the eternal miracle, is the Qur'an itself. Because in the Qur'an, there is a lot of scientific miracles. Qur'an told us God is swearing by his ability to create the fingertip. What's a fingertip? After 1,400 years, the science discovered that this is one of the most complicated parts in the human body. There is the fingerprint here that none of us has the same fingerprint of the other. People did not know that 1,400 years ago. A lot of scientific miracles. If you contacted me on this email, I can send you, inshallah, I can send you, uh, God will, uh, the uh, uh, genius presentation called The Miracles of the Quran on a videotape. And by the way, our presentation today is outside cost price on a videotape that was aired uh, on Fairfax Public Access TV for I think $5 they are selling it. You can buy it and uh, watch it again. And please send me if you have more questions on my email, but I need more uh, aggressive questions and more uh, offensive questions than those. And thank you very much and please enjoy the dinner. <laughs>